Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to everyone that's here in person and all of you online. We're glad to have you here this morning. Oh, we had a beautiful picture to wake up to this morning. A couple inches of light, fluffy snow. That I was thankful for. If we're going to have snow, light and fluffy is the best because, you know, you can take the leaf blower and clean off the car with that. Uh, it's a beautiful day outside. We've got a great covering of snow out there. God is good. And I'm just excited for our service today. This morning, uh, Pastor Mark uh, continues our series with Do the Wrong Thing. We've got to be interested. And I better turn up. There we go. Can you hear me now? All right. Mark's trying to tell me that I'm not even turned on. And <laughs> I'm not paying any attention. All right. Well, again, welcome. Glad to have you here. A beautiful day to get going here this morning. And with uh, Mark's message this morning, continuing in our series on the Do, Believe, Do You Believe movie is Do the Wrong Thing. And this is going to be a really great message this morning. And there's a lot of, of meat and a lot of things we need to, to really listen to. Uh, for the call to worship this morning, we'll be in the book of Romans, chapter 7, verses 21 through 24. And here what Paul writes to the Romans. He says, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. Now, this power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And as I've, as I've just been praying about this, these verses over this past few days and, and getting ready for service this morning. The one thing that just resonates with me is we've gone through a, uh, a really rough 12 months. Um, we've had a pandemic, we've had a lot of tension, uh, both political, racial, social, there's just a lot going on. And it kind of boils down to this, we, we fight with ourselves on what we should do. We know what we're supposed to do. The good book tells us how we should act, what we should do. But we often rebel against that. And, and it's no more prevalent, no more, nowhere more prevalent than social media. And that's, this is my lasting impression I want to leave with you this morning before I turn this over to Mark for the message that he has for us today. When we post on social media, what is your goal? Or is your goal to tick somebody off, incite someone to get mad? Or is it to act in grace, act in truth, and act in love? I saw someone post something political. And the comments blew up and it was there was nothing in the middle there was no love in, in it there was no grace there was no mercy it was just it was either over way over here or way over here and, and what is that where are we getting with, with that where's that going is that doing you know last week I said do something but Mark's going to tell us this morning about, let's not do the wrong thing. Let's do what's right. Let's do what God wants us to do. Let's interact with others with grace, with truth, and with love. Father, as we prepare to hear Mark's message this morning, as, as we hear about uh, making uh, decisions, whether good or bad, let that message resonate with us. Let us hear how you want us to make those decisions, where we should go before we make those decisions, which we, we know, Father, is prayer, but too often we get fired up and, and, and we miss that. So, Father, help us to hear what you need us to hear this morning. Make Mark your vocal piece this morning. Let the words that come from him this morning 
fill our hearts and our minds and give us a lesson that we can take out and immediately put to use. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Terry, and a very, very good morning to everybody here. Uh, so glad to see your smiling faces and you're so bubbly and awake this morning, kind of. And, uh, you know, it's a great day. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. See, we had to make a choice to get up and get out of bed this morning and, you know, face the snow, the new fallen snow out there and come in and, and be in in concert with each other here, to be in communion with each other, to come and hear God's word and to be fed. And so as I was uh, preparing this message, uh, I actually started on a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, as I was preparing the message, man, I'll tell you what, uh, doing the wrong thing. As the Bible is full of examples on what not to do. And so it's kind of a great guide to go with. And this morning as, as I was uh, kind of getting fed myself, I was listening to Dr. David Jeremiah, and he was talking about the book of Ruth. And the book of Ruth starts off and it talks about, you know, how Israel was in the midst of this famine, but it wasn't just a physical famine, a, a food famine. It was a spiritual famine as well. After they came and and settled into the land of Canaan in there, they kind of turned away from God because, hey, they got what they wanted. They got into the promised land, but then they went right back and reverted back into their old ways. And so they were in a spiritual famine. They made a series of wrong decisions. And the book is only four chapters long, but it tells a wonderful, wonderful story. It starts off talking about how many bad decisions they made and, and what it led to. And there were some horrible, terrible consequences to it. So it's kind of a tough read in the first two chapters of Ruth. But then it goes on and it talks about turning things around and redemption. And it talks about, you know, how you can turn that situation around, turn back to God and how God did a mighty work in a 10 year span of, of years, he did a mighty work with the little town of Bethlehem. The little town of Bethlehem. And so the book of Ruth is a very, very easy read. It's, it's like I say, only four chapters long, but it tells a great redemption story from taking and making a lot of bad decisions that had bad consequences. And then, asking for redemption and God granting that redemption. So it's a wonderful example of how we as Christians, though we may make bad decisions and we may go against the will of God, God doesn't abandon us, doesn't strike us down, doesn't smite us, but he gives us a way, a path back to him. And that's really kind of the theme I want to talk about today and, and you know, I'd like you to kind of have audience participation today. So I'd like you to raise your hand if you've ever made a wrong decision. So, okay. I see most hands are raised here. Okay. Yeah. So I'm right along with you. You know, I've made some bad decisions. And for those of you who didn't raise your hands, and I see you out there too, uh, you didn't want to admit it. And sometimes we don't want to admit it when we make a bad decision. You know, it kind of looks bad. <laughs> well, it is. But don't you kind of wish that all the hard decisions that you ever had to make in life would come to you as a teen? So this kind of popped into my head the other day. Because, I mean, teenagers have all the answers, right? Any parent knows that. Because they told you they know better. So all of life's hard decisions should come to you as a teen. Because then you've got all the right answers. Okay, well, maybe not. But in a study, it was shown that most major mistakes are made before the age of 30. So, you know, you get up to the age of 30 and you make most of the bad mistakes that you're going to make in your life. 
See, in that point in time, you kind of learn from some of those mistakes. And later in our life, our way of, of thinking changes from the, what we were as teens. And we tend to want to evaluate the circumstances and possible ramifications and then act instead of just going out and acting first and then paying the consequences later on. So in other words, we learn from our mistakes and we make more informed choices past the age of 30. <laughs> so in spite of our best intentions, we all make mistakes in our lives. So the, the call to worship this morning that I chose came, comes from Romans 7, 21 through 24. And the reason I, I use this illustration in here and I, I use this translation is because it really speaks to what we have and, and what we come across. And it says, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And that translation seemed to really jump out at me. And it, and it just filled my mind with all kinds of different illustrations that, that uh, could pop around. And so, have you ever felt like a two-headed being, one that wants to do what's right, and the other can't help but do what's wrong? And see, when I was younger, there was this commercial and it had a devil on one shoulder and it had an angel on the other. And each vying for that person to do their bidding. And I found this image in here and I went, hey, you know, if I take my glasses off, well, I guess maybe in my younger years, that could have been me. Same hairdo, a little less silver on the sides. I had my hair cut yesterday on purpose. But you have this... You have this devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other, and they're both kind of fighting back and forth. And that's exactly what this verse of Romans is talking about. And, you know, this, this image of the devil and the angel at work in our lives is, is really, really a powerful message because it is absolutely true. There is spiritual warfare going on for each and every one of us in our lives each and every day. And it kind of goes to, who are you going to listen to? What voice in your head are you going to listen to? And this verse in Roman that talks about that, although I want to do good, evil's right here with me. Kind of in your shoulder, talking you through, going, eh, you know, you don't really have to do those kind of things. And it tends to want to lead you astray from the will of God. And it tends to want to lead us towards that really easy out path that we can take. Because this other one might be a little bit harder. You may not want to go down that road. And so I found that as an absolutely perfect illustration. And that image has been used in varying venues over the years to represent a myriad of things. But it always comes down to one thing. Good or bad. And I often thought it'd be great to be able to see ahead into the future and therefore you're always going to make that right that good decision and in roman mythology if we look at the other picture that i've got up there it's a, there's a picture of a two-faced deity that would do just that and it and his name was janus and janus could look into the future with one head and look into the past with the other and so he always knew what direction to go and see, Janus, he frequently uh, symbolized change and transitions as the past or the path to take to the future. From one condition to another or from one vision to another. And the neat thing was, though, the one thing that it was really used to symbolize was that transition from youth to adulthood youth to adulthood and he represented time and because he could see into the past with one face and the future with the other he became a very very 
viable deity in, in Roman culture and Roman mythology back in the day. And, th and, you know, I think that this would be handy because we could always see what the outcomes of our decisions would be and what they would be in the future. And then we would never have to make that wrong choice. So it'd be kind of neat to have that. But see, that's all mythology. And we live in reality. We live in reality. And there is only one God. And see, if we turn to God, we don't have to worry about the future. He is already there. He's already there, and he's already prepared our way into the future before we were ever born. We, we, in time and morning, he was there and had a plan for our lives before we were ever born. And we talked about kind of what that looks like in John the Baptist, because, you know, when John the Baptist came, he leapt in the womb. That Holy Spirit awoken him in the womb. See, before he was born, God had that plan. And that plan was already at work in John the Baptist. And I kind of talked about this. So when we take a look at this verse in Romans, it really speaks loud to us. And if we look at these pictures, it really kind of gives you that illustration. I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is always right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in... God's law but I see another law at work within me waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me and what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death and see in Paul's writing there he shows us here that the law is powerless to save the sinner. That law will do nothing for you as a sinner. The sinner is actually condemned by the law, and the law keeper can't live up to it. And see, there's that person with a new nature finds his or her obedience to the law disrupted by the effects of the old nature history. Those things that trapped him within that prison of sin. And there's that great tension in our Christian daily experiences that we have of being trapped in our past and wanting to be that Christian. We want to be on that path that God has set for us. We want to believe. We want to have faith. We want to do things. But we have that constant battle going on between good and evil within us. And we have to really tune our voices, tune our voices to God to get us on that path and to keep us on that right path. And one of the things that it, that it does is, it says those voices of the past, those decisions that you made, those sins that you committed are the past and they're called the past for a reason. They are behind us. They are not our future. God has a future plan for us, regardless of the decisions we made before, regardless of what has us trapped in the past. We are both the prisoner and the gatekeeper to our own prison. Yeah. We're our own worst enemy at times. Because we tend to listen to the wrong voice in our head. We have to get our mind attuned to the word of God. To the voice of God. Getting us on that right path. And keeping us on that right path. The conflict is that we agree with God's commands. But we just can't seem to do them. And as a result, we're painfully aware of our sin. And this inward struggle that we have with sin is as real for Paul when he wrote this verse. He was saying, I am struggling with this. This is a person who was anointed by God, who was completely transformed and was transformed by God, changed from this persecutor of Christians into the greatest proponent 
of Christianity there was. And he still struggled with these decisions. He still struggled with the voices in his head of his past sins. And they were great. As he says in the scriptures in there, as Paul says, he says, I am the greatest sinner of all. But through God, who saved him, he's able to get past those sins and live a godly life. And see, that promise that God gave Paul is the same exact promise that he gives each and every one of us here today. God is alive within us. We have to wake up. We have to jump out of that grave that we're in. This Rise Up Lazarus song that I, that I love by Cain. It speaks to that, that, that we are trapped. We're in our own prison. We need to rise up above it. God calls us out of that tomb, out of that prison. He unlocks the chains. And he did that through Jesus. He did that through Jesus. And from Paul, we learn what to do about it. Whenever he felt overwhelmed by that spiritual battle within, he would return to the beginnings of his spiritual life. And he would remember how he had been freed from sin by Jesus. And see, likewise, we need to do that same thing. Instead of looking backwards at our mistakes and living that miserable existence, we need to look at, and we need to look back and say, God released me those things. I'm not subject to them anymore. I'm not in that prison anymore. And when we get overwhelmed and confused by sin's appeal, let us claim that freedom that Christ gave us. we got to embrace that. His power can lift us up to victory once again. And Paul declares that salvation cannot be found by obeying the law. No matter who we are, only Jesus can set us free. Only Jesus can set us free. 1 Peter 5 and 8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. How many times do we let that lion get a hold of us and eat us alive? How many times do we listen to the wrong voice and trap ourselves in our own prison? So I'd like you to take a look at a clip from the movie and it kind of sets the stage for what I'm talking about in here of being trapped in our own prison. Something we should have done a long time ago. Put it back. What's the matter with you? Terry, uh, Kathleen is gone. She's not away at college or working in Minneapolis. She's not coming back for Christmas. I know that, JD. This is my daughter's room. This is all I have left. This is not a room, sweetheart. It's a museum. No, no, I think I remember it. We're living in the past. What else are we supposed to do? Terry, the world didn't end when she died. Ours did. No, it didn't. We wanted it to, but it didn't. And ever since, we've been selfish. We've turned our grief into our most prized possession. God doesn't want that. Where was God the night we lost that wing? I'll tell you where he was. He was asking that man not to take another drink. Begging that bartender not to serve it to him. He was hoping he'd call a cab and go home with a friend. Anything would get behind that wheel. When it was all over, Cried, just like we did. Why are you doing this, JD? Why now? Sweetheart, you know how Matthew said that belief is an action? Well, it's time for us to act. We've got to get back up and start living again. I want to do more with this time I've got. There's a whole world of people out there who need help, who have no place to stay. 
And every time it rains, they sleep wet. And every time it's cold, they sleep cold. We turn our whole life upside down when it's a sermon? No, no. I've been thinking about this for a long time. That sermon has given me the courage to actually do something about it. Pretty powerful. And I think we've all been there at one time or another in our lives. We've all been there. And so here we have JD and Terry, and they've lived in a life of active grief for 20 years because their daughter was killed in a car accident. And then after hearing that message of the cross, that message of salvation, that message of redemption, that message of release. He decided it was time for a change, but Terry wanted to stay in her grief because that was her comfort zone. And see, she was still very angry with God. She blamed God for her daughter dying. She blamed God for her daughter dying. J.D. describes where God was when the accident happened. Because she asked him, she says, well, where was God when our daughter died? And J.D. says, he tells her that God was there when the drunk driver was at the bar trying to tell him it was time to quit drinking. And he was there telling the bartender not to serve him any more drinks. But see, that bartender and that drunk driver, they made wrong choices. And so it goes. And just like that drunk driver in the moment, we think we're fine and we can handle the choices that we're making. We don't need anyone to tell us right from wrong. We're in control. But the truth is, we aren't in control. And we end up suffering those consequences of our poor choices. And in this instance, they drug another person into that equation. And the resulting tragedy touched many lives. Not just their own. Not just their own. And see, they ended up living out those choices for the rest of their lives. Do you let your present circumstances dictate your choices? Your present circumstances determine your future? Do you find yourself living out past mistakes, keeping you from living the life that God has planned for you? See, J.D. and Terry, they stopped living and they made a wrong choice. They locked themselves into a prison that they built on a bad decision that someone else made. They let the past circumstance rule their future, or a lack of future in this case. And I term that living in the past darkly, and it's an incredibly dangerous path for us to take, or for anyone to take. And it usually leads to few further bad decisions based on what you've done in the past unless it's acted upon. Sometimes the evil one uses obvious temptations like the guy drinking, letting him he believe that he was in control, leading to a path of self-destructive behavior. Another soul claimed. Sometimes he's more subtle like chaining Terry and JD to their past forcing them to live life in a box, never reaching out or venturing too far. Their lives were literally at a standstill. Literally at a standstill. Romans 7, 21 through 24 says, the easiest prey to eat are the ones that are standing still. Parking in the shadow of your past is the surest way to be caught. 
trapped in that prison that you built for yourself, you're standing still. You're standing still. When we live out an instance from our past over and over again, it imprisons us internally, leaving us in bondage of that past incident. Whether we had any control over it or not, whether we had any decision in the process or not, and in the process of doing that, we are rejecting that possible future that God has planned for us. Our lives are made up of seasons and we need to learn from our mistakes and move on. We need to rise up above those mistakes, rise up above our past and move on. We need to trust God and put Jesus in first place in our lives, have him at the controls of our life. Because we're not in control. I'm here to tell you. I thought I was in control of my life many, many times over. And boy, I'll tell you what, when God wants your attention and says, you're not in control, he will make it very clear. And sometimes it really scares it out of you. It really scares it out of you. See, we need to grieve for those past things that we have no control over. And we need to move on. We need to set ourselves right emotionally. Grieving is a process that will help us let go of that past. Get in touch with our feelings. Yes, it's a traumatic incident. And, and <laughs> this week, this week has been really tough for a lot of us in here. We've had a lot of loss this week. And over the past two weeks. And over the past year. Loss in many different ways. And it's good to grieve those things. It's a process we need to go through. But see, at some point in time, we need to let go. We need to rise up out of that grief before it takes over our lives. We need to move on. We have choices to make and lives to live out. We have Jesus to guide us through along the way. We don't have to make these decisions all by ourselves. See, God sent Jesus to give us a living example of what to do and how he is active in our lives each and every day. He sent the Holy Spirit to live in our hearts when we have faith and when we believe in that resurrection cross. And when we do that, he gives us a resurrection heart. He lifts us up out of that grief and puts us back on that path to life and life through him. And your past may be darkened, but your future can be very bright if you make the choice to bring that right person along with you to help guide and direct those decisions you make. So I say to you today, we need to escape our past, embrace your present and your future, choose to live life. Choose to invite God into your life and embrace the path that he has for your future. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come and the old is gone. The new is here. The moment we invite Christ in our life, we are a new creation. Our past is gone. Our sins, our prison, our shackles are gone. We are a new beginning. We are a new being with Christ in our hearts. We need to embrace this. I'm going to read it again. <laughs> Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Wow. Does that give us something to live for? And the answer is, no matter what you're going through, the answer is yes. 
And not just a small yes, but a resounding yes. Rejoice. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. He has given us resurrected hearts. New life is already here. But the old must leave so you can grab a hold of that new life. We got to make room. We got to make room to have Christ living within us. Get rid of that old junk that's cluttering up the mess. It's cluttering up your life. It's keeping God out. We got to make room to let God in. Let it go and embrace what's next. Let it go and let God. Let it go and let God. See, and in doing so, we need to recognize when God has a change of season for us, we need to lay our burdens at the foot of the cross and give it to God. But see, we tend to rely on ourselves instead of God. And that's what's got us in the situation we're in to start with. I've said it many, many times that we were good at taking our burdens and taking our sins and taking our problems and laying them at the foot of the cross. And then we come back and we pick them up. You know what we're telling God at that point in time? I don't think you're big enough to take care of those problems I left behind. I got to do it myself. Wow, what a mistake. He set us free from those bags of burdens that we've been dragging around, holding us back, keeping us down. He freed us from those things. Why would you ever want to pick them up and take them with you? Why? Let us recognize today that we need to Leave it to God and show him that we have faith and that he is bigger than any problem that we face, whether we cost it or not. And this would become what I term a defining moment in our lives, in our faith lives and for our future. If we want to live out a future life, if we want to actually live life, not restrained by all the junk. Not restrained about by all the things that have held us down. See, we are that new creation in Christ. The past is gone. The old is gone. It no longer exists. Leave it there and move on. Rise up in Christ and take hold of your future. He's got it planned for you. He's already there. Pave in that way. We need to pay attention. We have defining moments in our lives. And when we have a defining moment, we have two choices. We can let it define us, or we can define it. And again, it comes to that matter of choice. So if you're taking notes today, great. I got some notes for you. Choice number one, make a choice that leads to life. Make a choice that leads to life. Number two, never take a road just because you think it might be easier. I'm going to take the easy way out. We know what the scripture says about that, that the, that the road to hell is wide open. That gate is a wide gate. And that road that leads to Christ is the narrow gate. Go in through the narrow gate. It may not seem easier to you. And I know I said this a couple of years back. There was a song that, that talked about the highway to hell. The highway to hell is a very, very wide road. And it's very easy to go down. But that stairway to heaven, that stairway to heaven is much narrower. And it takes work to get up those stairs. But it's worth it in the end. That journey is worth making the effort to go to. Invite Jesus in to make the choice with you is choice number three. Invite Jesus in to make that choice. Now, if we do that, what do you think is going to happen? 
Well, he's not going to let us make a lot of wrong choices. I'll, I'll tell you that. I'll be a spoiler alert. If we invite Jesus in and we pray about it before we make that decision, he's going to guide that decision process to the right choice. To the right choice. Choice number four, don't ignore the opportunity to make this choice now because you think it might come later on may never come again. Now is the time to make the right choice. Today's the day. The time is now. Make that choice that leads to eternal life. Make that choice that leads you to the future that God has for you. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 10 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls like a round lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So what does this tell us? It says, hey, we're not in this alone. We're not in this alone. The family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. The same kind of sufferings. And that God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you've suffered a little while, will restore you to himself, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And you need to understand that temptation to ignore a defining moment might be your roaring lion. When that choice, when that opportunity comes your way, today, make the choice. Make the choice. Define your new future. It's important to note that defining moments don't always come in a friendly form, sometimes we're faced with choices we don't want to make at all. But again, we have that choice to make, as I said at the beginning here, either that choice will define us or we will define it. And the choice is ours. Acts 9, 1 through 6 says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. Well, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. See, for Saul, later Paul, it was nothing short of transforming. For Paul, it was being blinded and spoken to by Jesus on the Damascus Road. And we see so many examples throughout the Bible. For Moses, it was a burning bush. For Peter, it was walking on water. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it was walking through that fiery furnace. Untouched. Untouched. For Daniel, it was his deliverance from the lion's den. For Joshua, it was parting the Jordan River and crossing into that promised land. See, there's many defining moments in the lives of human beings that change their lives forever. And these defining moments often set the course for the balance of their lives. Name one of these people that I just named that was the same after 
encountering God in a defining moment. Their lives were changed forever. But more importantly, they lived out that future life that God had planned for them. And in doing so, set the course for other people's lives as well. And changed them for the good as they went through. And look, they're still changing lives today. Still changing lives today. There have been many defining moments in the lives of human beings that changed their lives forever. And it set, it set the course for the balance of their lives. Are you ready for this today? Are you ready for your life to be changed for the better? Today may be your defining moment. In J.D.'s case, he heard a sermon that stirred him to the point to said, I don't want to be that person that I've been for the last 20 years. And I'm not saying that I'm giving you all the answers today. But maybe God is talking to you through this message. And today is your defining time. This is your defining moment. This is your chance to make a choice. To live your life out for Christ. For the better. And I could go on and on from here. Each one of those servants that I said had been in preparation for years leading up to that defining moment. These moments forced the servants to be involved in something beyond their human experiences. It took them outside of their own paradigms. Their paradigms of life. God had to move them outside of that box they had closed themselves into. And when he did, their lives were never again the same. And see, you might be in one of three different stages in your life yourself at this point in time. You may not have had your defining moment yet. And God might be preparing you with many important life experiences. So you need to take those life experiences, whether they're good or bad, you got to take the good with the bad. And you got to take the bad with the good. Because God might be using those to prepare you for a future. Number two, you may have had your defining moment and you're living out your call. And you need to embrace it. You need to embrace it. You may be toward the end of your journey and you've already experienced your defining moment. And you need to embrace where you are today what God has brought you to and what God has brought you through. We're all called into a relationship with God and we are all called vocationally, meaning that God prepared us for this moment. And see, that's often ushered in by a defining moment. When God brings us to something or brings us through something, it's often to give us that defining moment. And you got choices to make. There could be more than one defining moment in our lives, each pointing you down a path that God preordained from the foundation of the world. And the secret to a great life is often our ability to discern that defining moment as each one is given to us. We need to embrace them. We need to understand them. And we need to learn to walk in the path that leads us to our ultimate destination. So what happens next? Once you have that defining moment, you're never the same. I can tell you that. We need to pray that we have eyes to see and ears to hear when God brings that defining moment into our lives. And you might be sitting there going, well, what if I mess up? What happens if I mess up? Well, see, sometimes the wrong thing is wholly unintentional. So you're saying, well, what's next then? What if I screwed up? Well, if we realize we've done the wrong thing with a defining moment, 
See, the nice thing with God is it's never too late to change. It's never too late to make a different choice. He gives us free will. The ability to choose which path we want to be on. And it's never too late for us to change the path that we're currently following. How about that? Living a life chained to our past, poor choices is always the wrong thing for a follower of Christ. We're not only denying ourselves the future that God has planned for us, but we may be holding back others that our path intersects on the way, keeping them from God's future that he has in store for them as well. See, we might be that catalyst that brings that other person into their defining moment. How about that? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever touched someone's life, met someone, and given them that little spark that they needed to help them along their way? God prepared us for that in our hearts. That was a defining moment in their life. God used us to help them live out the future that he had planned for them. Philippians 1.27 says, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. See, two weeks ago I told you that faith requires action, movement, response. Otherwise, it's nothing more than simply knowledge. And when we apply this to our calling, our defining moments, this comes to light that we are called together to act upon our faith. To lift each other up and to edify each other as we journey on our paths of life. We all have different paths to follow in life, and sometimes we intersect with one another. But we all have one destination as believers in Christ, and that is eternal life in the presence of Almighty God. So I have some questions for you that you need to answer. What action do you need to take this week? Who can you reach out to? Whose prison gate can we open? Who can we walk hand in hand with to the Master? How can we aid others in their healing of past events? Who do we know that is dealing with loss, with illness, with guilt over past decisions? We need to make the time to stop and talk to them. Offer up our own beliefs and the difference that Christ has made in your life. It may be just the key that they need to set them free from what they're living. Another avenue for us to think about today is to confess. The Bible tells us there is healing in confession, so find a trusted friend, a pastoral counselor, or let go of that past sin or the issue that you keep hanging on to. See, that, when you hang on to it, keeps you imprisoned in the past, in grief, in loss, and in misery. We need to repent. And for those of you who don't know what the term repent means, it means to do a 180, to completely turn yourselves around. So we need to repent. If you know in your heart that you've missed that defining moment, ignored that chance to make a difference in your life or in someone else's, or you walked away from a faith moment that you should have seized, simply repent. Turn around. It's never too late. Do something new like J.D. did. We saw his example. Pack it up and turn over a new leaf. Let go and let God take over and allow him to do that mighty work that he has planned in your life. So I have several things I want to have you as takeaways from this today's message. History does not define your future. 
In fact, we have history in order to rewrite our future. If you have made mistakes, done the wrong thing, missed those moments that Jesus was holding out for you to seize onto, move on. Repent. Confess. Move on. Faith requires action. Move on. 2 Corinthians 5.17 This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. Old things are gone. The new is here. We need to embrace it. Live it out because you are a new creation in the presence of Almighty God. Let us pray. I would like you to pray this along with me today. Lord Jesus, I humbly come before you today. I thank you for making me new. You raise me to life. And then you invite me to a grand future with you. You redeem my life as I follow you. Jesus, you restore my future. Thank you for never leaving my side as we walk this journey hand in hand. Help me to keep taking steps toward and forward with you. Lord, I come before you now and I ask for a reckoning of my heart. May I trust you, Lord Jesus, that I am exactly where I was meant to be. Let me not forget the infinite possibilities that are born of faith in you. May I be confident knowing that I am a child of God. Let your presence settle into my bones. And allow my soul the freedom to break out of my past prison and to sing and to praise and to love as you have loved me. Embolden me to reach out to others and share your good news. In your holy name. Thank you, Mark. Um, I can honestly say I think I'm worn out from your message, not from listening to you, but from all the, the wisdom that you gave us this morning, and I want to thank you for that. And it's interesting, as, as I was looking at the scripture before coming up this morning, um, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul, starting in verse 17, starts talking about uh, the Lord's Supper. And he's talking about what are the reasons in which we share this meal? What is our motive behind sharing this meal? Are we just doing it because it's what you do? And he also calls out what's in here? What's in your heart as you take the bread eat it, and then drink. Are you doing it out of a positive intent? Are you doing it because you want to remember what Christ did for you? Or are you doing it because that's what we do every week. We just take communion. It's just like when it snows, you go out and shovel. When the mailman comes, you go out and you get the mail. It's just what you do. But no, it's so much more than that. Starting verse 23, Paul writes, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself on the night 
when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks for it. We're thankful for this bread, not because it is a nourishment because we're hungry, but for nourishment for our spiritual well-being. It reminds us of what Jesus did on the cross for us. And then he goes on and he says, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, he took a cup of wine. And this is after supper. And this is, you know, if, if you study the scriptures and, and, and you study the, the Jewish culture, this, they would have already sang a couple of hymns at this point couple of songs and, and he fills the cup and he says this he says this is the cup of the new covenant between God and his people an agreement confirmed with my blood do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it so Jesus is telling us that as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup we are to do so and the scriptures then tell us we are to do so until he returns. Because he's not going to have this meal. He's not going to share this meal with us until he comes back. And I know there's a lot of folks out there right now that are going, Lord Jesus, come back today. We need you now. But as a pastor, and, and, as, and I, as many of you, I know so many of you have a heart for, for the lost. And you want them to know Jesus. You want them to have that relationship. And you want them to do it before it's too late. And, and Mark and I had the privilege of, of sitting with someone yesterday. And we both felt it in our hearts. That this person's loved one who had passed was in heaven with Jesus. What an amazing feeling that was to have. Now we do take... we. Before COVID, we would take a piece of the bread and dip it in the cup, but we want to be keep everyone safe. So if you're watching online and you would like one of these cups so that you can take communion with us, whether you're watching it live with us right now or you're going to be watching later in the week, we can get you these. So just let us know. Drop us a line in the comments. Email us. Call us. Because this is an important meal. This is something we do to remind us of exactly why Mark gave us the message that we had this morning. Of, of the things that we can leave. You know, I was waiting for leaving the luggage at the cross and walking away from it and never turning back to it. That's what we need to do. Give it to God. So as we take the bread and, and the cup this morning, think of those things. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Father, we, we don't deserve this amazing grace, this wonderful mercy and love that you give to us in forgiving us for the things that we've done in the past. Father, through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, as we accept that into us, Father, let, that, let the Spirit be guiding us and directing us in every decision that we make, in everything that we say and in everything that we do, Father. So that the, as we take this bread and drink of this cup each week, that it continues to remind us of that gift. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. It's now time uh, for the prayers for the people, our agape time this morning. I invite Denisa. I have to say, I think you've said it all, <laughs> and Terry also. Uh, it's been a beautiful sermon this morning, and um, I'm just grateful to be in this house. And does anybody have any prayers for anybody else specifically today? Um, I do have a God sighting. Yesterday, Steve and I were on a drive, and um, we saw several eagles, bald eagles, and they were beautiful. And God's creation is beautiful. And one thing we saw is we had, there was two uh, eagles sitting in a, in a field together. 
which I thought was very odd. They were sitting like only two feet apart. <laughs> so, but it reminded me of God talking to us, like maybe that was a dad eagle talking to his son. And uh, so I just thought that was quite amazing in my mind. And, and uh, I just know that if we listen for God's voice, he's always there to guide us. But he gave us wisdom to find in his word through the Bible. And he gave us the Bible to speak to us so we know how to live our lives. So we're not chasing after some abstract faith. So, Father God, we just uh, come to you this morning. And we just lift everyone up that are in our hearts and minds and thoughts today that, that need your help, Lord God. For you came and you walked among us and then you died on the cross to save us from our sins. You went down to the grave and you took the keys of Hades and you came back up to rise again. So we have faith in you. There is no sting in death. There is no, no more sadness when we get to heaven, Lord God. But we need to find you first. Lord Jesus, don't let us waver like a ship on the sea. Help us to read your book and read your word and put it to use in our hearts and our minds. Help us to be strong and courageous in our faith, Father God, that we may know who you are and know that you came to save us and help us to have faith so that we can have hope in our lives daily. In Jesus' name, I thank you, God, for all things. Amen. So as we come to close this portion of our service today, our online portion, uh, we thank you for being here with us today, and we uh, really, uh, we really appreciate you spending your time with us and with God this morning. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we pray that you pour out your love on us without measure. It's true that we're all from different backgrounds and different walks of life. But because we're here with one heart, as one body in you, Lord, let your message be heard and accepted and put into action. Be with us all as we go and let your worship be alive in our hearts daily as we live it out for you. Thank you, God, for giving us our opportunity to be here and to worship together freely and openly. 